Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon. And uh, my name is Pratip Naik. I'm going to be uh, moderating and chairing this particular session. And sorry for the slightly delayed start. Uh, you, you already know that we are in a hybrid mode today. So, uh, so this is the session uh, which is titled as Getting Adaptation Right in Iran. And uh, the session number is 1.3. If you are in the wrong session, you know, this is the time to kind of you know, move to another room. Uh, we heard a lot about, you know, getting adaptation right uh, in one of the plenaries this morning. So they're already carrying a lot of ideas uh, on uh, the theme of uh, getting adaptation right. Uh, so this is going to be a jam-packed, you know, uh, kind of, you know, uh, session because we have speak, uh, six speakers uh, and uh, we have one point, uh, uh, you know, one hour, 30 minutes, and we have already lost kind of, you know, seven minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow each of the presenters 10 minutes um, and then uh, while we're switching uh, between the speakers, uh, we will allow 30 seconds to 40 seconds for any quick follow-up questions, uh, but we'll reserve a bulk of time to the end so that you know we can take questions. Please write down your questions as you uh, listen to uh, each of the presenters. So we'll start with our first presenter, which is going to be a remote presentation via uh, Zoom. Our first speaker is uh, Kanai Tokunaga, and uh, Kanai is going to uh, speak uh, um, about understanding the roles of knowledge and learning in climate resilient small scale uh, fisheries. Over to you, uh, Kanai. Uh, you've got 10 minutes. Uh, and I'll give you a one minute reminder. Thank you. One problem. I see that host has um, disabled um, screen sharing. So I'm wondering if you're able to resolve that. Okay, I am going to share screen and turn on the presentation. Um, please let me know if you are seeing the presenter mode. Um, but, yes. um, hello again, um, thank you so much for coming to this session. Um, so today I'm going to present on the synthesis of case studies that we conducted um, as part of um, SNAP Working Group on Climate Resilient Fisheries. And I'd, I would like to recognize that um, I have um, two co-lead authors, Megan Fletcher and Lily Zhao. They're both um, um, early career scholars um, participating in this project. So before I present um, on today's topic, I wanted to um, show that, um, introduce you to the, this group, SNAP Working Group on Climate Resilient Fisheries. I in, embedded a Q code here. So if you're interested, you can scan this and learn more about our project. But this working group is, um, so international working group is led by um, three researchers, all based in the United States, Kathy Mills at GMRI, Kristen Kleisner at Environmental Defense Fund, and Pat Sullivan. Uh, who recently retired from Cornell University. And this um, group is studying how um, uh, resilience is operationalized in climate, um, in global fisheries. And we define, this group defines climate resilience as the ability of a system to recover, adapt, or transform. Um, last year, we worked on a literature a literature survey to uh, develop attributes of uh, climate resilient fisheries. And I again um, embedded a Q code here. If you're interested in reading this paper, um, you can scan this and then go to this um, paper's link. But um, by reviewing uh, existing literature of climate resilience, we developed a set of um, attributes that describes um, this fisheries climate resilience. And um, there are three domains, uh, dimensions, governance, ecological, and socioeconomic. And each uh, dimension have five domains, organization, flexibility, assets, agency, and learning. And as I was working on this um, project, um, I was in charge of looking at the socioeconomic defining socioeconomic uh, resilience attributes. But I really got stuck uh, when I was trying to kind of think about um, the learning related attributes, knowledge diversity, knowledge access, learning capacity, and adaptive governance. These are all the attributes that are 
often discussed in sustainability literature, but when it comes to operationalizing these attributes, um, that's where I got stuck. We didn't know, I did, I still, I'm kind of, um, I'm still learning, but these are um, really challenging topic, especially because we don't know how to operationalize, say, learning capacity. So, um, so I wanted to dig deeper in this topic. And uh, related attributes, we also considered agency and leadership initiative. These are very important interlinked uh, attributes related to um, other attributes of learning. So I'm going to um, go ahead and um, describe what the learning attributes actually mean, but I'm going to, I wanted to mention that I'm also looking at broader sets of attributes as I study, as we study learning attributes. So we gave a thorough definition of these um, uh, resilience attributes in a aforementioned paper um, published in 2021. But um, I am specifically looking at these four attributes, diversity of knowledge sources, access to knowledge, learning capacity, and adaptive governance. And I'm not going to the, the details of the definitions, but um, but I think, and then these are pretty self-explanatory, but the key is that we're looking at these attributes as a component of climate resilient fisheries. And these things can um, help communities, small scale fisheries um, be, uh, become better equipped to climate change and other types of shocks. Okay. So we're looking at what, are the roles that these learning related attributes play in shaping relate, uh, resilience and what other resilience attributes um, could complement knowledge and learning and also how indigenous and local ecological knowledge are integrated in the resilience planning in small scale fisheries. To understand how these attributes um, are operationalized in small scale fisheries, uh, we relied on the 18 expert led case studies. These case studies are conducted as part of the aforementioned SNAP working group. And um, each um, case study is led by uh, mostly academic, ex academic um, scientists, but these scientists work um, also with the uh, local stakeholders and practitioners to develop these case studies. Um, out of 18 expert-led case studies, there are 12 small-scale fisheries and two of them are located in North America. Each case study um, consists of um, case study templates and case study narratives. Case study templates collect a common set of information, including contextual description of the fishery, resilience action. So if they have any, if they, the fisheries have experienced any shock in the past, such as natural disasters, how they um, responded, those are the resilience actions and then also um, capacity to improve climate resilience. And then finally, the resilience attributes. Um, um, those are the set of attributes uh, described in the paper um, in 2021. And um, we also have the case study narratives, which captures the description of resilience story. So we asked the expert to develop a narrative to tell the story of resilience for each fishery system. So when it comes to types of knowledge, um, we have the broad kind of categorization of this knowledge. One is scientific data and another is indigenous local knowledge. Scientific data consists of a variety of information, but uh, we're primarily looking at fisheries, the availability of fishery dependent data, fishery independent data, and environmental data, such as ocean temperature, and also indiv um, indigenous local knowledge. So I wanna give you a kind of brief overview of what are the types of data that are being used by different fisheries around the globe for resilience planning. The first is a fishery dependent data. We found that nine out of 18 fisheries, um, so in terms of fishery dependent data, all of the fisheries had fishery dependent data. 
um, but um, we also asked uh, who collects and reports fishery dependent, dependent data because it's important for uh, the process of partic participatory and adaptive governance. And we found that nine out of 18 fisheries had multiple contributors. And for the North American small scale fisheries, regional government, um, individual harvester and harvester associations, as well as dealers, processors, or their associations as um, the contributors of this type of knowledge, the fishery dependent data. Fishery independent da data, on the other hand, is um, may not be available for many small scale fisheries. So six small scale fisheries reported that they do not have any fishery independent data. And only one out of 12 fisheries answered um, that there are multiple contributors of this type of information. For North American fisheries, um, for the, so for the North American small scale fisheries, I should have explained earlier, um, there are two fisheries that, uh, that, that there are two case studies. One is California Dungeness crab, and the other is Maine lobster fishery. For the Dungeness crab fishery, regional government, uh, which is the state government, um, provides the fishery independent data and the main lobster fishery is the national government, um, NOAA providing the fishery independent data. Um, environmental data is even more scarce, but interestingly, um, many fisheries reported that there are multiple sources of environmental data. And I think that's just the nature of um, how environmental data is collected. Um, national, in the North America, for the case of North American small scale fisheries, and the um, NOAA uh, community organization and universities and scientific organizations are common sources of environmental data for fisheries management for Dungeness crab and the Maine lobster fishery. Dungeness crab lobster, um, sorry, Maine lobster fishery also listed the harvester and harvester association and environmental NGO contributing to provide this information. Sorry, I'm getting over time now. So I'm going to um, skip ahead because I covered this earlier in the session, but what I really wanted to highlight is that the importance of diversifying knowledge sources in the small scale fisheries. Um, and I, there are different ways of doing that. One way is really through the social capital um, knowledge sharing, internal knowledge sharing through bonding social capital and external knowledge sharing through linking and bridging social capital. Many case studies also noted the importance of having social diversity as a way to contribute uh, to having a more diverse set of um, data. So again, who holds the knowledge and whether the knowledge is shared is really critical. Another thing is that there are two types of knowledge to decision process. One is design process, which is um, examples listed here, and another is a customary process. Design process, um, um, this case, they often have scheduled meetings to discuss fisheries management. On the other hand, a customary process has spontaneous gatherings or daily routines to meet. Design processes um, design, basically designing multi-stakeholder participation through workshops and other meetings. Um, customary processes often harvester led. Design process uh, has often a prioritizing, the practice of prioritizing and identifying scientific needs versus customary process often rely on lived experience or indigenous local knowledge. So we can characterize design process as a deliberate adaptation at a customary process as an um, as responsive adaptation. And um, knowledge to when it comes to knowledge to decision, multi-stakeholder participation is a key and a participatory learning through um, participatory monitoring is really um, highlighted in many cases as a way to broaden the knowledge of the fisheries to, for the adaptation planning. And so there are agency can be exercised through data collection, monitoring and participatory governance. And then also, sorry, and um, as a, a as a part of participatory governance, so agency is a critical component, and it needs to be um, there to complement the process of knowledge to 
uh, for that knowledge and the learning attributes to be activated to help with the resilience. I am out of time, so I'm going to stop here and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kanai. And uh, please stay with us, you know, so for questions at the end, you know. Uh, so next speaker is uh, Sarah, Sarah Halper, and Sarah is going to talk about bringing perceptions of fairness into the fold in navigating climate change impacts on fisheries. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Harper, and I'm going to be presenting some work today that I've been involved with over the last couple of years um, with this wonderful team of collaborators and co-authors that we're presenting on behalf of today. Um, and this work really looked at sort of broadly at fisher perceptions of climate change in the Pacific uh, fishing region of Canada. Um, and this particular piece of the work looks at um, those perceptions through a social justice lens. So, um, so this work really hinged on the question of what are BC fish harvesters' perception of their vulnerability to climate change? And um, this understanding was elicited through um, an online survey that targeted Pacific Region commercial license holders in 2020. Um, the survey went out at the beginning of the pandemic, um, so not ideal timing. People were obviously focused on other things. So um, this may have limited the uptake of the survey, but we still had 104 um, participants in the survey. So although there's um, probably around 3,000 participants in commercial fish harvesters in BC, um, this isn't necessarily representative of, of everyone, but gives a snapshot into what some of the perceptions are of fish harvesters. The survey had about 50 open-ended and categorical questions. Um, that focused on um, perceptions of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And then we also asked a number of different questions um, about concerns sort of beyond climate change as well as related to it. And this was really a collaboration across industry, government, environmental NGOs, and academics. Um, and I'll, I'll follow up at the end and sort of name some of those different organizations that we worked with. But really, it was a sort of co-produced survey um, and both the getting the survey out to fishers and the analysis of the survey um, was this sort of collaborative process. And I think that's really an important thing to mention. So jumping right into the results, at least some nuggets of the results, if, um, I'll just mention the report that includes all of the results of, of this survey it just came out and I'm happy to share the link um, with any of you who are interested, but these are just some of the specifics. So the majority of the, the, the respondents to this survey um, were concerned that about climate change. They believe climate change is happening and think that it will harm future generations. Um, so definitely concern there. Um, and this was sort of an example of a series of statements that we asked the survey participants, um, the one that I just mentioned on the top, and we won't go through all of these because we don't really have time, but just to give you a sense of the richness of the data that came out of this. Um, so like I said, there were these categorical responses, there was also open-ended questions to allow people to expand a little bit more. Um, when asked what about specific fisheries, commercial fisheries, and how they may fare in terms of um, warming ocean conditions, salmon, um, obviously a big concern on the Pacific coast, um, and not surprisingly, was perceived to have the strongest negative impact from ocean warming. Um, and then in terms of positive impacts, there was the perception that um, albacore, albacore tuna would perhaps have a, um, a positive impact. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so this is, uh, um, again, you don't need to know all of this and read all of this, but this is um, the, the data that came out of that question around perceptions of ocean warming on specific commercial fisheries. And the ones listed on top are the salmon fisheries, and you can see um, more concern about a negative impact there. Um, just, I'll just point out the column on the right. We did give um, respondents the opportunity to say, I don't know. And um, this is kind of interesting. A lot, of, a lot of the harvesters are involved in salmon fisheries, but I think there's just a general 
better awareness about some of the concerns related to salmon fisheries and perhaps less so for some of the invertebrate and other fisheries. Um, so one of the other things that came out of this was that fishers surveyed expressed concern over the impacts of various planning processes and competing sectors, signaling potential areas for friction and conflict. Um, and so we asked in the survey harvesters to um, list based, you know, going through this list of different sectors, um, what which ones may ne negatively affect their fishing success. And some of the ones that came up on top in terms of strong negative impacts were aquaculture, recreational fisheries, marine protected areas. And so um, these things also came out in some of the open-ended responses, but things that I think are, are, you know, in terms of adaptation planning, we need to be aware of these potential conflicts between other sectors because they may be amplified in a climate change context. Um, so 72% of the survey respondents um, perceived fisheries management as unable to adapt and respond quickly to changing environmental conditions. And this was a really interesting response. Um, again, some of the open-ended questions sort of fleshed out um, what people were concerned about in terms of management and how this might be amplified in, in the climate change context. Um, so this is the series of statements that we asked um, the participants about adaptive capacity, both themselves as, as well as the institutions and, and management organizations. Um, and so um, definitely some things there to unpack. I don't have the time to do that here, but we go into that a little bit more in the report that I'd be happy to share the link to. Um, one of the things I got really curious about when I was going through and reading the open-ended responses were um, themes that came up around equity and justice and, and, and fairness of, of different issues related to fisheries. And they weren't always positioned within um, the same sentence as, you know, these things are going to come up because of climate change, but certainly they could be exacerbated because of the, the changes in, um, that are linked to climate change. And so I then kind of applied this social justice lens to those responses. Um, and, and, and categorize some of what the harvesters were saying into the um, framework. And for this, I looked at two aspects of social justice. There's you know, several dimensions. And the first being distributive um, justice considerations that came up in those implemented responses. And so distributive justice is to do with the, the equitable distribution of um, costs and benefits associated with a particular thing in this case, um, fisheries um, within that sort of climate, um, changing climate um, <coughs> notion. And so some of the things that came up were um, quite frequently were um, the barriers faced by young harvesters. And this came up this morning in some of the plenaries and is really um, of concern across all of the coasts. Um, but with the increase in, in a, the value of licenses, it's really hard for young harvesters to get into the industry. And so this creates issues of succession and sort of that intergenerational equity piece. Um, there was a lack of, uh, people articulated a lack of clarity on things like work fisheries reconciliation. And I think that's an important thing to draw out of these responses. People felt quite comfortable just sort of saying what they were thinking, uh, and they might not bring these up, things up in more of a kind of conversational public forum. And so, you know, I think having better communication uh, around those things would help people understand how allocation is, is changing or um, how access is changing. Um, MPA establishment also um, a concern for people limiting their access to the fishing grounds that they've always fished in. And there's a big push certainly on the Pacific coast and I think also um, on the Atlantic to designate a certain percentage of the coast as marine protected areas. And this is a big concern for fish harvesters who've been fishing those grounds for, for, for many, many years. And not that we shouldn't protect areas, but that this needs to be part of the dialogue. We'll just go there. Okay. Uh, the other element that came up was around more of those procedural justice considerations. And so those are um, procedural justice has to do with sort of the um, the management process and the, the ability for people to voice their concerns and opinions and be part of that process. 
And so some of the things that came up related to that were um, the need for more participatory processes, including harvesters on the water knowledge um, in the management process, um, cooperation and coordination across agencies and jurisdictions. Um, and, and like I sort of brought up previously, that piece around communication and transparency in some of those planning processes where there seems to be a lot of confusion and friction. So just in summary, um, what um, I drew out of this survey in terms of that social justice framing and some of the key considerations was that BC commercial fish harvesters are concerned about climate change, but there's also many other stressors. Um, harvesters felt fisheries management is unable to adapt to climate change, um, and this is concerning that there's not there's not a trust there in, in how things are being managed. Um, there's challenges over competition for space and resources. This came up quite frequently, and this could lead to conflict if it's not um, you know, addressed. So viewed through a social justice lens, uh, res the responses from the survey really highlight important distributional and procedural justice considerations um, that are necessary to take Take, you know, take into account in adaptation planning fisheries. And I think there needs to be more focus on these things in order to kind of move forward. So this is just the list of lovely different organizations and groups that I uh, worked with for this work. And I guess a big shout out should be given also to all the harvesters who, despite being in the middle of the pandemic, responded to this survey. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, any quick follow-up questions? You know, I, I, uh, I have one. Okay. Sarah, when, when when you did the survey just say climate change or did it provide some scenarios of what time climate change work right, or did you just allow the answers to bring their sense of climate change? Probably more of the, the latter. Um, I mean the survey was um, there was sort of a, a bit of a preamble, I can't remember exactly what it was, but we didn't want to kind of lead people too much into exactly what, and so we wanted people to bring their perspectives, but that, you know, we did provide some framing in the categorical okay. question, obviously, um, and so, um, but we also wanted to have the opportunity for people to just kind of flush things out, and like I said, there were some people who responded to their, the, you know, some of the challenges in fisheries in general and the links exactly to climate change were not explicitly kind of flushed out but you know these are all things that i think are important i mean responding to to fisher or responding to climate change is really about good fisheries management right and so that requires um, understanding all these other challenges and sort of addressing those as well yeah. thank you one quick follow-up yeah. if i may yeah uh, when i was looking at the list of the species that you know yeah. they were the species were listed in Specific species. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're they're specific fish like fishery so species gear combinations. Okay. Yeah. And I saw in terms of what what we may call forage fish, you know, the only thing the sardine up there because I think that's also a commercial fishery. But was there is any sense of you know the other you know trophic system the fish you know fishes in the forage what we call the forage fish area? Oh, you know, I um we were just focused on those, so we didn't get much okay. beyond okay. that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, sir. Um, we move on to the next presenter, which is uh, Natasha uh, Tamburelli. And uh, Natasha is going to present uh, uh, in the title, A Climate Smart Fisheries Monitoring Framework for Guiding Adaptation in the Small Scale Fisheries uh, Sector. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for coming to my talk. My name is Natasha Tamburello. I'm a systems ecologist uh, with a focus on fisheries at a small consulting company called ESSA based out of Vancouver. And I'll be talking today about climate smart fisheries. Uh, as you're all very well aware, uh, the impacts of climate change are already being felt in the fisheries sector and small scale fisheries are at even greater risk. Uh, action in this space to date has been focused uh, historically on bottom up vulnerability and impact assessment with an increasing shift in the last five to 10 years to adaptation planning. Uh, and many of our experiences in fisheries with the impacts uh, and adaptation uh, strategies are accumulating first in the global south um, and as we heard this morning in plenary, there are many lessons that northern countries like Canada can learn from our global partners who are um, already have accumulated quite a bit of experience um, in this kind of activity. So you might at first think that Caribbean fisheries and um, 
the Canadian fisheries don't have that much in common, but uh, from having worked on both, I think they are actually not so different after all. These are often small remote communities uh, with multi-species fishers and fisheries that have a greater emphasis on subsistence fishing. Uh, they tend to be um, more exposed to climate hazards and they often have more limited capacity for government-led monitoring and adaptation given um, their remoteness. Uh, and in both places, a lack of information can really constrain adaptation. And as we also heard again this morning, uh, climate projections are not always enough to fill that gap because projections do not always align with um, the reality of how uh, impacts unfold on the ground. So to help uh, build up that information base, uh, climate smart fisheries monitoring that uh, covers the entire fisheries value <coughs> chain is really essential for guiding informed adaptation. So status and trends monitoring is essential for understanding system change across uh, space and time. Importantly, to assess uh, realized impacts in comparison to projections and to inform adaptation, while effectiveness monitoring really enables um, the wise use of limited resources on uh, the most effective interventions. And I'm going to speak to you today about um, some work that I co-led for the Caribbean uh, region on developing such a, a monitoring system to help to uh, inform and accelerate adaptation in the region's small-scale fisheries sector. So uh, in the Caribbean, much like in Canada, fishing is a way of life. It brings an immense sense of identity to its participants, and almost all fisheries in this region are considered small-scale fisheries. The sector employs almost 200,000 people and yields billions in annual uh, foreign exchange from exports and is a huge component of local uh, protein intake in the diet. But of course, um, the biodiversity and ecosystems that underpin these fisheries are threatened by a wide range of cumulative stressors and climate change is now adding to the challenge of sustainably managing these fisheries. And a recent UN report um, identified the Caribbean fishery sector as the world's most vulnerable to climate change. So to help accelerate this transition to climate smart fisheries, um, the uh, Inter-American Development Bank through funding for the Caribbean track of the pilot program for climate resilience has been funding science to accelerate adaptation mainstreaming in the region. Uh, and one of these projects, which I will not read out loud here, that will cut into my time, uh, that was spearheaded by the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism and the University of the West Indies um, and delivered by my organization, ESSA, help to uh, fill this gap and accelerate this transition. This was an interdisciplinary project that involved a region-wide impact assessment, the development of a tailored monitoring system for the sector, and importantly, also um, in-country training of fisheries managers to help to accelerate adaptation through the use of the tools developed through this work. So I'll just touch really briefly on the first part. Um, we carried out an ecological impact assessment through spatially explicit modeling of climate change impacts on um, the habitat suitability, richness, and catch potential of over 100 individual Caribbean fishery species, and then uh, use those changes in catch potential to further project uh, economic impacts um, through changes in uh, availability and pricing through supply demand models. Uh, and these products were really great. They really improved the information base available in the region uh, for adaptation, but they are not sufficient on their own uh, to inform adaptation. And so they were complemented with the development of a tailored monitoring framework. And so despite the importance of monitoring, at the start of this project, there was no regional system in place for tracking the impacts of climate change in the fisheries sector. And um, part two of this project aimed to fill that gap, and I'll walk you through our approach. We started out with a baseline status assessment of monitoring in six pilot countries that this uh, project focused on in the Central and Eastern Caribbean um, to understand what the baseline of monitoring was that we could build upon. And uh, in general, these countries uh, do have effective catch and effort monitoring systems in place, but uh, often have gaps in biological data, um, socioeconomic data, and um, habitat information generally due to a lack of capacity. So um, we next looked at um, impacts in the region and um, the outcomes of the baseline assessment and formulated six big questions, as we call them, to help guide monitoring uh, in a, a really focused way uh, related to the physical, biological, and socioeconomic impacts that could be expected from climate change. And we then uh, co-developed climate impact um, conceptual models with regional fisheries managers and use these to identify key indicators along major climate impact pathways um, that could help to answer those big questions. And so this work uh, yielded 26 uh, different uh, indicators across um, 
a few different kinds of uh, sampling designs that I'll speak to in a moment. And these spanned um, all of the stages of the fisheries value chain uh, in a way that is um, simple and focused and will help us to answer the questions managers are interested in. Along with those indicators, we also developed um, a sampling uh, guidance for the monitoring system and then packaged details on the monitoring um, uh, proposals into a series of quick reference monitoring cards. I'll speak to these a bit more now. Uh, so on the sampling design side, we propose a system of one nested master sample frame as a reference for all activities. Uh, this is a really useful way to improve the efficiency of monitoring by looking for opportunities to co-locate monitoring for different indicators. Um, and it is also really essential and helpful for uh, facilitating data comparisons, data sharing, and data, uh, data rollout, both within the countries collecting this data and across disparate countries in the region to help draw insights um, on climate change patterns and trends at a larger regional scale. Um, we had many big questions and indicators, but fortunately, um, they uh, mostly targeted just a few different uh, sample units. And so we were able to propose three standard sample designs that capture the bulk of all of the metrics uh, in our scheme, in our framework. And these were landing site or market survey designs, a benthic habitat sampling designs, and a pelagic sample designs with the ability to capture um, other things through uh, customized uh, surveys or remote sensing. All of this advice was packaged in a series of quick reference monitoring cards um, that provide lots of information uh, for um, people who are interested in implementing these methods. And uh, they are meant to be modular and recombined to be tailored to um, local interests. So I'm very quickly now gonna take you through lessons for the Canadian context. Um, first and foremost was the importance of this uh, unified and standardized uh, monitoring and reporting metrics for climate change. Um, we have this, uh, this is well advanced in terrestrial systems and hazards in Canada, but is still emerging in the marine space and is really needed for synthesis. Uh, and a good illustration of this point is that um, many national climate data portals are still focused almost exclusively on terrestrial uh, climate hazards and indices with the exception of sea level rise. We saw um, the really great potential of community-based monitoring for helping to fill in some of the data gaps, especially in these remote places. There's two nice examples here I don't have time to get into, um, but these programs are really essential for filling gaps, increasing capacity, and enhancing data sovereignty. But there's a need for um, improved data standards and stable funding to enable these things. And um, Indigenous communities have done a really great job of uh, exemplifying the success of these approaches through Indigenous guardian programs across Canada, and lots of tools are now available to support, um, uh, support the implementation of these systems. And lastly, um, uh, despite all of the strategies that exist for adapting to climate change, uh, perhaps the most important is still just strengthening basic fisheries management. There's lots of evidence emerging now that this alone can help to offset a lot of the impacts of climate change. Um, and where those frameworks exist, they can also facilitate the mainstreaming of more explicit climate change information into fisheries decision making, uh, like um, novel approaches like risk equivalence through climate conditioning advice. And there's a nice example from this part of the world with Greenland halibut. So uh, to wrap things up, um, I wanted to uh, highlight that I feel that these approaches and the importance of uh, uh, climate smart monitoring can help us to move beyond the world of um, assessing potential vulnerability and impacts to monitoring realized impacts on the ground and that data collection and collaboration with communities can help us both um, update our uh, expectations for expected climate impacts and also inform adaptation in the present. Um, and we uh, hope that, or I guess my hope is that we really benefit and look to uh, the experiences of our global communities to help to accelerate um, this change in Canada as well, so that we can have fish for today and fish for tomorrow. And I'd like to thank all my funders and collaborators. Please email me for questions or to point you to the full outputs of this work. Uh, and thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll keep the questions to the mm -hmm. end. Sure. Uh, we still have three presentations to uh, move through. So the next presenter is uh, Ian uh, Rupani. And uh, Ian is going to present on the title, Understanding the Past to Build Resilient Futures. Um, documenting historic deep water flounder in surface was in Newfoundland. Good day, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian Ivany. I am a uh, project coordinator with FFAW, uh, this Fish Food and Allied Workers Union here in, here in St. John's. Um, just quickly to start, uh, 
This is a deep water flounder project, a uh, fisheries knowledge project specifically, um, and you can see there are funders below. It was through OFI and also the government of Newfoundland and Labrador. So why deep water flounder? Uh, well, being a reunion, we're in constant uh, communication with our members and many long term, long, long term, uh, long time inshore harvesters approach FFAW requesting research in historic flounder fishery. Now, the historic flounder fishery was an important component of a sequential multi-species fishery uh, from approximately the early 70s into the early 1990s. Um, so it was a, an important component of the fishery. And, and how important um, we found out as we, we conducted the survey, these interviews, but uh, very much we're hoping that this data, understanding the, uh, the historic abundance and historic spatial and temporal range of this fishery, might help with any potential future fisheries and with, uh, with the American place. So basically overall our project objectives, uh, three main objectives, documenting the spatial and temporal extent of the fishery, also the fishing practices and catch rates, as well as the con contribution of this particular species to fishing season and income. And overall, as I mentioned, this is a fisher's knowledge project and we hope to the, the integrate a lot of this uh, knowledge into existing data, which I'll get into in a future slide. And more broadly, I guess, and in the themes of the conference, is it possible we laying the foundation for a sequential multi-species fishery that would include this particular species down the road? And more broadly, as one of our, uh, as our director of the Inshore said this morning, Tony Doyle, uh, the sustainability of rural Newfoundland depends on the sustainability of the fishery. So broadly, if, if we do have a sustainable fishery, it will lead to a sustainable rural Newfoundland. So just briefly on the species itself, it's also called American Place. Um, both sides of the Atlantic, from southern Greenland to New England in the U.S., under moratoria uh, since the early to mid-90s. Uh, no director fishery currently, but there is bycatch, um, mostly in the NRA region in the offshore, specifically. Um, not to the level that it used to be, but we still, for example, in 2017, there were 11, approximately 1,100 tons of deepwater flounder caught in, uh, in the NAFO region. So just want to talk briefly about some of the existing data. Uh, specifically, this one was looking at specific grounds where, where the flounder was fished historically. And this is from the uh, Community Coastal Resources Inventory, which was developed in the late 90s and was developed by DFO and developed in partnership with community groups. Now, I should say this is only a presence absence map. There's no data indicating anything about catch efforts or you know, the abundance as such. Um, there weren't even actually the interviews that were conducted with uh, harvesters in communities. Um, basically, there was uh, there's no linkage to what community they were even living in, actually. So all we have is just the presence absence of a, of a fishing area in this case. And we also have some landings. Uh, this is from the NAFO data from 1960 to 2018. As you can see, there was a huge drop off within the moratoria, but there's still some caught. Um, there are also RV surveys that are uh, that have been, uh, but basically the areas inshore where most of the harbors caught flounder not necessarily have been surveyed consistently since 2006. And actually, they only actually started surveying these areas in the mid 90s. Um, so even while the, pro the, the fishery was ongoing, actually we're getting this, uh, this data as such. As for our methodology, uh, we interviewed 25 harvesters, uh, ranging from Notre Dame Bay to Fortune Bay. Um, St. Mary's Bay actually were the harvesters that first approached us. It was very important in that particular region of the province. Uh, so this place over a year and a half, and participants were also provided with a what we heard summary afterward, uh, just to let people know just you know, what we got from the interview to make any corrections if they needed to, and just uh, give their impressions and their and sign off uh, if they're okay with their information being used. And uh, during the interviews too, questions were asked, as I said, about the spatial and temporal extent of the fishery, and as well as fishing practices. We also asked them to fill out maps, uh, designating exactly where they fished. So just a little some demographics. Um, What's interesting here is that three started in the 1950s and actually one is still fishing today. So even though four, four of the 25 are retired, uh, there's one man in the 70s who still fishes, who started in the 1950s, which is quite a while ago. Uh, 24 directive for Flanders specifically. Um, and we did include the one indirect as well, because even though it was indirect, uh, on an average year, this person was getting 10 to 15% of both catch and income, uh, just on you know, American Place alone. So that's fairly significant. And we did ask as well if they saw any, uh, of, of, the, of the 21 who are still fishing, we did ask if they saw any flounder bycatch in current fisheries. And some did in cod specifically, but they weren't seeing much. And basically if, if someone answered they weren't, see, they weren't seeing much bycatch or even if they weren't seeing any, their answer was typically the same on the why. And it fell, fell into a couple different categories. First of all, the, uh, the type of gear used. Uh, nets, when you, especially when you're typically when you're fishing for cod, you're using five and a half inches. 
And for flounder, a much bigger mesh size is needed, as I'll talk about in a, in a second. And as well, the areas they were fishing were not necessarily traditional uh, flounder fishing grounds. There's a specific type of fishing ground that is more useful. Most almost unanimously, all 25 harvesters agree there's a certain type of fishing ground needed um, to fish flounder. And uh, basically, most fisheries today they don't they don't fish in those same exact grounds. So even no matter what the amount of flounder bycatch they got, this was the reason that they said why there wasn't much or not at all in some cases. Uh, and just briefly, I just wanted to show uh, just, these are uh, basically when people started. Um, so there were two, for, for the start dates for the fishery, um, there were two common responses given. That was in the spring, whether it be early April up to mid-May or in the summer months, uh, early June up to mid-July. The reason for starting in uh, the spring and the spring usually uh, was because, well, they started fishing flounder as soon as they started fishing in general. So whenever they started fishing for the year, whenever the weather allowed it, and that was basically the determining factor on when they started uh, the weather. And it was also a determining factor on when they ended in a lot of cases. Uh, some harvesters waited until June or July, and that was due to um, basically bait fish, as in Capelin. Uh, Capelin would move into historic fishing grounds, and the, uh, the flounder would follow them to feed, and they know that that time of year would be the perfect time to uh, start fishing flounder. Uh, in terms of gear, most use gillnet uh, or a combination of gillnet and trawl. One interesting thing was that some use gillnet in the summer and switched to line trawl in the fall. Uh, mesh size generally was in the seven to nine and a half inch range. Um, around the seven, eight usually though. Uh, the number of nets were pretty varied. Um, soak times were pretty consistent, two to four days. And most got very little bycatch. And just, just a quote, uh, another quote, actually, sorry, earlier was a quote as well, uh, in quotations, but just as sort of a, just to say that basically, yes, eight inch was used. And they drew some experimentation going on in that time as well. So they would try different mesh sizes, but eight inch was uh, seven and a half to eight inch seemed to be the common, what, what people use it for the most part. Uh, and I mentioned briefly the grounds earlier, uh, but the grounds started for flounder were muddier, sandy and level, ball for about one harvester. So, so basically, those were the rounds preferred, and sometimes a combination of muddy or sandy, but generally level for all. Let's look through this really quickly. Um, so again, that's a quote from a harvester. Contribution to catch and income have also varied, and also the annual catch, but the greater contributor income was in St. Mary's Bay, where they went as much as 30 to 50% compared to Fortune Bay, which was only about 10%. But even that is quite a significant amount to someone's income for the year. And again, the amount of fish caught varied over the season, and you could get one, day, one 48 hour period, you'd get 6,000, another 48 period, you could get 10,000. So very quite a bit. And this is just a survey of the areas that people pointed out where they did catch, uh, did catch flounder. And this is overlaid with the CCRI data that I put up earlier. So pink is uh, the interview data and yellow is the uh, CCRI data. See, there's some overlap, but there are some inter mis interesting areas that are missed. For example, Fogo, around Fogo Island, I know was a, a, a particularly uh, historically important uh, American place fishing ground, but it's somewhere we haven't actually touched in any of our interviews yet. And so I should say, this is an ongoing project. Uh, we're going to continue to interviews, uh, interviews, plus look at some survey comparisons with our own data. And the take home, I'd, I'd like to focus on the first two points, uh, you know, provide an important variable income for the multi species fishery up until the early nineties. And the spatial and temporal scale of the fishery is varied, but maybe substantial. The third one, we can't really say a lot yet. And this is from an earlier version, sorry. So I, I think we're hoping that that's the case and preliminary is showing that, but I wouldn't go that far with um, the saying that right at this point. And thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, any quick follow-up questions? Quick, keep the big ones for that. Just uh, yeah. uh, deep water, what, what, what's the depth? Uh, funny enough, I you know when I first started talking to people, they said they were found at depths you know over 100 fathoms, 120 to 150. But people were fishing them certain times of the year, like under 40 fathoms. Okay. So I always thought maybe that's a bit of a misnomer in a way. It's it's not necessarily found only in the deep water. But then just want to follow the the, the so time you say was more than you know two to four days. Days, sorry, sorry, that didn't uh, quickly rushing through. Days of during the you know, ah, uh, not so much. I mean, it, and uh, the big the big question I had to was spoiling specifically, yeah. like it being legal. Water, but, water. Yeah, but apparently, yeah, the cold water and apparently deep water flounder compared to most other ground fish, apparently it lasted longer. It was uh, yeah. So, thank you. Thanks very much. We'll have time at the end uh, for yeah, the certainly. questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So the next uh, presenter is uh, Ider Grenner. Uh, uh, is very. Thank you, and thank you everyone for these uh, very interesting presentations. 
my name is Eider Ganel and I work at the University of Western Brittany in France. And I'm going to talk about the decline of European CBAS stocks in uh, RSC, which is located in French Brittany. Um, as a part of the Fish Intel project I am currently working in. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the data we gathered from the from the conduction of uh, semi-structured interviews with the local fishermen of the of the area. Uh, so just a quick presentation of the project. It is a cross-channel interreg project of two years and would finish in March uh, 2023. Um, the project focuses on different sites across the channel. Uh, three of them are in France, uh, three of them are in uh, southern UK and one is in, in Belgium. And it is coordinated by the University of Plymouth and involves 12 different partners across those uh, three countries. And the aim of uh, Fish Intel is to identify and protect essential habitats for a selection of uh, commercially important species uh, in the channel, which are European sea bass, crawfish, pollock, and bluefin tuna. And the added value of this project is the, the use of underwater acoustic telemetry through a network of uh, acoustic receivers and, and fish tagging uh, that will enable us to understand more about the behavior and the movement of those species uh, in the area. And so to do this, uh, the Fish Inter project really works very close with uh, the local fishermen to do all, all of those uh, deployment of the acoustic network. And the University of Brest, the UBO, is the lead of the World Package 3, which deals with societal issues, ecosystem services, and governance. Uh, so just so you have a, a better idea of where we are located in France, uh, this is a map of the RSC, which is located in French Brittany, in the west part of France, and covers a surface area of 3,550 square kilometers. Uh, what's interesting in this zone is that there's uh, many protection areas at sea. There's one big marine natural park that was the first one that was ever uh, made in France, uh, here in green. Uh, there's 12 uh, protected areas in sea that are part of the European Natura 2000 network that covers uh, protected sites both in land and at sea. And there's a very strong fishing tradition in the whole uh, French Brittany sector, and particularly in this zone in the RSC with uh, recreational fishing, but also uh, small scale uh, fishery with uh, 136 uh, active vessels recorded in 2019. And by active vessels, vessels I mean uh, vessels that quasi exclusively fish in the RSC in all this zone, um, for the most part inshore fishing. So to get back to the European CBAS in this area. Um, it is one of the most important economically speaking species for professional fishing in this sector. It is the second species landed with 162 tons landed in 2019 by the vessels that fish quite exclusively in, in, this, uh, in this sector. And is the first target for recreational fishing in, in the whole in France with more or less uh, 2,300 tons per year, according to IFAMER data. And however, this species is today considered by scientists to be below the biomass threshold in the Northern area of Europe, which includes the RSC and all of our uh, fish and tail pilot sites. And a very significant decline in reproductive in reproductive stocks biomass has been observed by French Britannese fishermen during uh, since the last 20 years, more or less, uh, but nothing was uh, made at that time. So the local fishermen have themselves um, proposed some, uh, some restrictions, some uh, seasonal closures uh, by not fishing during the reproduction period or on the nurseries, uh, but they, they did that as a, in a volunteer way. They, they were not forced to do that, but they started getting this, uh, this situation. So all of those observations and the significant decline in adult biomass that was reported by ISIS in 2013 has led to 
uh, European Union to put uh, to implement some emergency management measures uh, since 2015. And those management measures include catch restrictions, quotas, depending on the type of gear. So, for example, for hook and line fisheries, it is up to six tons per vessel per year. And it is up to 1.5 tons for fixed nets per vessel. And they both need uh, uh, an authorization, a uh, specific license to be able to fish for seabass in the sector. And for troll or centers, there's a bycatch allocation up to 5% of the total catches, and they don't need a specific license. Um, those, those management measures also include temporal closures during the reproduction period with French Prevenice fishermen already uh, did in this sector, but now it's uh, more, uh, more uh, controlled. Uh, so that makes that fishing for seabass is only authorized from March to November in the northern part of Europe. And there's also a minimum size restriction of 42 centimeters that applies everywhere in the sector and both for professional and for recreational fishes. Uh, so, we conducted some semi structured interviews with local fishers. Um, the purpose really was to um, gather their local ecological knowledge and uh, all they knew about the species behavior, the movements, and uh, the area specifically, the condition of the stocks, and how they are adapting to the decline of the sea bass and to the, to the current situation. Uh, but they have also, as I said before, in the project, we work very close with the local fishermen. So they have also helped the scientific team of the project with uh, by sharing their, their knowledge with them uh, to find out the best, uh, to identify the best locations uh, to put the acoustic receivers. Uh, for example, places with no so many current, uh, places where they knew this species uh, was passing through, etc. And they also helped uh, so much with the um, tagging campaigns by uh, going on board with the scientific team or leading uh, their boats, etc. So in total, we conducted 11 interviews, uh, eight with anglers. One of them was uh, an angler and traps, two with netters and one with an action director and local authority. And the main harvested species by those professionals were mainly Sibas and Pollock. And the main highlighted points uh, of those uh, interviews were, first of all, that all of them has observed the decline on CBAS stocks, both in terms of quantity and uh, the size of the individuals, but also a change in the behavior of the species that they, that they didn't uh, notice uh, 20 years ago, for example. Uh, so the decline of this uh, CBAS stock that was for many of them, especially for liners, or anglers, the main species they fish uh, has made them uh, forced today to diversify gears and target species um, because if not they they cannot still make a living out of fishing and they cannot they could do it 20 years ago but it's not possible anymore so um, and that's where it becomes complicated for them because they have to uh, invest more human and financial resources, they have to learn new techniques, uh, they have to uh, go further and further offshore to find for fish, so uh, that's how they, they, they really, uh, they really um, insist on, many of them are now turning to fishing for other species such as seabrim and pollock, and what's complicated with pollock is that there's no practically no management measures for these species because there are some quotas but they are never reached so it's the same as uh, so they really insist on the fact that a species should be managed while it's still in good condition and if not it's going to happen exactly the same as for seabass so they they really insist in this uh, in in this uh, point thank you <laughs> We'll wait for the questions uh, at the yeah, end. We have one more uh, presentation. Um, the next presenter is going to be uh, remotely joining us, and uh, the presenter is uh, Alexandria Mezer. And Alexandria is going to present on the uh, topic activating personal locator uh, beacons. 
the impact of cold weather exposure on and dexterity for a personal locator or become activation. Um, so hi, my name is Alexandra Major and I'm a master's student in engineering at MON. Uh, thank you so much for listening to my presentation today. Um, my master's thesis is investigating manual performance when using push buttons following cold water hand immersion. And my main supervisors are Dr. David Molyneux from Memorial University and Dr. Robert Brown from the Marine Institute. So today I'll be discussing a bit about my master's research. Um, so a bit about the project background of my research. So I'll be, I was looking at uh, usability um, of personal locator beacons um, in cold water conditions or cold sea conditions. Um, basically to see if there's any uh, issues with their activation when uh, water degrades the manual performance of an individual's hand. So for example, if somebody falls overboard, they will have to activate these devices without being able to see them. So what are personal locator beacons? So personal locator beacons are manually activated handheld devices, which are used to transmit a signal to alert nearby search and rescue authorities in a situation of distress. So this research is a point, very important because out of the many fatalities in the fishing industry in Canada, only between 2011 and 2017, emergency signals were not received by around 44% of the 63 fishing vessels. And uh, so I'm, my research is regarding um, the use of these devices with uh, having cold, wet hands. Um, so for my topic, I had to do a literature review. So I was looking at a, a number of different topics for my literature review, uh, mostly um, pertaining to fine manipulative tasks in which the buttons are not visible. So I was looking at uh, cold water exposure, on manual performance, I was looking at cold training on manual performance. I was looking at push button design and arrangement. I was looking at push button activation performance as well as haptic perception. So the sense of touch. Um, and there's a picture here, just giving an example of uh, a finger pressing a push button. So the main research questions for my topic, uh, there are two big questions. Um, does having cold wet hands as compared to having warm hands uh, wet hands negatively impact a person's ability to successfully activate uh, commercially available personal locator beacons. And my second question is considering button size, texture, and shape, which factors most affect a person's ability to both locate uh, and depress a button when they have their hands uh, cold and wet. So I conducted some experiments on 29 participants and uh, my experiments had four different stages. So the first stage I was looking at, I was doing some standardized testing. So basically I was doing some tests on getting an idea of the baseline uh, manual performance, manual dexterity and tactile sensitivity of the hands in a dry thermal neutral condition. And for stage two, I, I used, there's two different personal locator beacons, commercially available ones that I had. And what I did was I assigned uh, temperature condition randomly, as well as a uh, personal locator beacon randomly. And I given the participants some basic training on how to use them. And then I got them to immerse their hands in either one of either cold water or either uh, warm water for two minutes. And then afterwards, I gave them a device and got them to try to activate it without being able to see it. And this is shown by the barrier here. So I placed it in their hand and uh, when they felt like they activated, I told them to lay it on the table. So uh, they felt they had correctly activated it. So the third stage of the experimental methods is the button panel test. So this is a, almost like a square panel with 12 different buttons uh, located randomly on the panel surface of different sizes, shapes, and textures. So the main sizes here were small and large. The main shapes were recessed. Um, so embedded, protruding, sticking out from the panel, and also flat. So this is a beaten button assessment system that was used for stage three. So in stage three, the participants had to immerse their hands in um, uh, both the warm and the cold condition, their dominant hand, and then their index finger was placed to the center of the panel and they were instructed to look and to find and press as many buttons as they can within a two minute time frame. So for this one, their hand was also immersed for two minutes in one of the temperature conditions. And this is just a picture showing uh, how it was done. Um, so the button panel main results that were obtained from the experiments, this is a basic overview. 
So there's 12 buttons here because there's 12 different button types and the number of times they were pushed is on the left side of the Y axis. And it can be seen that there isn't really a huge difference between the button pushes um, between the cold, which was two degrees and the warm, which was 34 degrees. Um, it can be shown here that button 10 was the button that was activated the most, which was the large retreating and smooth button. And the button that was activated the less of the buttons was the small recessed smooth button. So in order to find out which factors were considered to be um, significant in this analysis, I used design expert software, uh, which is basically um, an analysis of variance, um, just to see um, you know, which of these factors, such as size, shape, and texture, are most significant for the design of the uh, <clears throat> for the design. So in the end, as you can see here, um, it was actually the button size that was the most significant parameter and then followed by button shape. But um, button texture didn't seem to have so much an effect. Um, so just an example here um, of cold performance uh, versus warm performance. So as you can see on the left, so these are the participants and the different variety of button types. So there's 12 different uh, button types. So the mean was around 8.2, different ones were picked for the cold and for the warm around 8.1 were picked, different ones. So this is just to basically show that there isn't really a huge difference between the warm and the cold activation in terms of the button panel test. Um, so in the warm, for example, uh, the maximum amount of different buttons found was 11 out of the 12. And for the cold, uh, actually interesting, they found all the buttons. So. So for the PLB test, um, as you can see here, there were four different outcomes that were looked at for the um, warm and the cold and the different stages of the experiment of the PLB experiment. So stage two is the first time they were activating the device and stage four was the second time. So here, um, as you can see, this is PLB one. So this is an example of one of the PLBs which was used and this uh, PLB was the one which had the buttons located on the side of the device. So um, as you can see here, um, the test button was pressed a lot in the warm condition. Um, and overall, the activation is here shown in the blue, the successful activation. And overall, I would say around 31% uh, was correctly um, activated out of, across all stages if you would lump sum it uh, together. So the conclusions of the study our temperature does not seem to influence the activation rate of both personal locator beacons or the push buttons on the panel apparatus. Um, and for the button design, uh, the most significant factor was the button size and then the button shape. So um, there was a lot of difference between the small versus the large buttons. And protruding was the best, then followed by the flat button and then the recess button from going from large to small. And Yes, yeah, so overall, the personal locator beacons were only activated correctly about around 31% out of 100% uh, for the participants. So, do um, you have any questions? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so we are going to open this up for uh, questions. We have roughly 10 minutes left. So, uh, please stay there. If you can unshare your screen and uh, uh, be on the video. And uh, Kanai, if you can also join us uh, via video, so we'll open it up for any questions. Uh, thank you very much for uh, those wonderful presentations. So in the remaining 10 minutes or so, uh, the forum is now open for questions to any of the six. Yeah. Questions, please. We're going to check if there are questions here on the Zoom. Uh, no. 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 No questions. Yes, please go ahead. Would you, would you like to come here and ask? You know, this microphone. Uh, if it is a question for the. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. Like, how do I do this? Here? The question was around um, um, just different discrepancies in the um, between policymakers and um, fishers in terms of um, their perceptions of of fairness and justice. And I mean, I haven't dove too much into the policy side for my work. Um, and I did do a bit of a scan of how that comes up and is articulated in in policy documents. And um, I mean, I think the concept of fairness in general is quite subjective, um, but I think the, the perception of unfairness and the sort of link to friction and conflict is the, the part that really interests me and that I was trying to unpack. And so, um, so I think it would be really interesting to see where there are those different kind of definitions of what people perceive as fair. And if you think of something like access or allocation, obviously there are differences of opinion in what people think they should be their share of the access. And so um, I was more focused on sort of how that leads to conflict and um, in the responses to the surveys, but yeah, I'd be happy to chat more afterwards, thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions, please? Other questions, yeah, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Jessica Blyz. I'm an official scientist from Rock University. Um, my question is on your work with Karen and I love what you're doing and the sort of practicality of it. I was wondering what you see if you have any next steps, like what is the application side of the next steps? Yeah, within that space that I can you could briefly repeat the question also for the online audience. Yes. Yeah, so the question was uh, for the presentation I gave on monitoring work in the Caribbean. What um, would I spell out as next steps for that work to be implemented? And so um, there is a bit of a, uh, you know, view in international development when you, these projects get made that if you build it, they will come. <laughs> but of course, um, capacity is a limiting factor to, you know, the, the monitoring and management that's already taking place in the region, let alone doing more. So I think, you know, like there's lots get, that could be done to support um, just implementing what we've done here. But I think that the main missing piece is stable and ongoing funding for these countries. And fisheries are, um, you know, unlike many places in Canada, they're a very disenfranchised uh, group of people and they don't have very much money or political power. And so there's not much money allocated to them. And so I would love to advocate for um, international funding agencies to establish something like um, uh, like a fund or a trust that could yield dividends that could be invested in monitoring because that's something that's not often seen as like a desirable way to spend uh, international development monies as um, part of like, you know, something that's considered uh, something that the government should take care of. <laughs> but I think it would be amazing to have uh, NGOs or funding agencies that would be willing to step up and commit ongoing funding, at least for a period that's enough to establish a baseline that could maybe be revis revisited and five or 10 years, because the problem in these regions is that there's like a real boom and bust cycle of data that's produced through a three-year project and then nothing for 10 years, and then a two-year project and then nothing for five years. And it really doesn't give you enough to do any kind of um, you know, assessment or uh, evidence-based management. And so I think there needs to be some way to, um, I guess, subsidize the monitoring that's needed in these developing countries to do the work and not just invest that money in uh, building more docks or buying more boats or uh, developing infrastructure when there might not be any fish there to catch <laughs> and process in those like, nice shiny new markets if there's no data for them. Thank you. Thank you. Natasha, if you could yes. say. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you. Thank you. So um, my question is about, um, it's related to, uh, I can't remember your language you said, but it you're, you you had discrete areas that you this master what, sampling what, frame. Yeah, what what guided you the setting of those boundaries? Yeah, and so uh, it, like the the map that I showed is sort of a generic grid with some concepts behind it that you could overlay on a specific country or island or region, and the idea is to you know um, have uh, like the same grid size and maybe the same uh, like quadrants being used by different countries the same uh, distance from shore for inshore versus offshore monitoring. So that's really easy to compare between nations, which otherwise don't much talk to each other um, when they're establishing these kinds of monitoring. And so it's really difficult. Like many of these islands are so small and so close together that they share the same stock. Mm 
but their fisheries data is not uh, combinable in any way because of the different ways in which it's collected. So it's almost impossible for most species in the region to do a real stock assessment because the data can't be amalgamated. Um, and so having something like a master sample frame that's agreed to at a regional scale would really help to improve that situation. If people could agree on the same, uh, you know, monitoring kind of spatial patterns and frequency for the same indicators that would go a long way to allow it now. I have a follow-up question, um, which is, did you look at then the, you mentioned hypoxia mm -hmm. in there, so that tells me that you were looking at a relationship between terrestrial and the aquatic, so like the effect of runoff and things like that. Was that part of your monitoring? Um, well, that's one of the contributors to hypoxia, uh, not the only one. Um, other things have to do with the, like the way uh, changing uh, sea surface temperatures, changing currents, and altering ocean mixing as well. Um, but that example, the example that I showed with the crab traps is not from uh, my work, it's from some work that was done by NOAA off the Oregon coast. And so uh, the problem they're facing there is that um, ocean warming is causing less of the mixing that the West Coast usually sees. And so you get these hypoxic dead zones at the bottom that are causing um, fish, mass fish kills for Dungeness. And so fisher folk are pulling up uh, traps full of dead crabs and that's like really not good. <laughs> right. And it's um it's really impacted the fishery on the West Coast in the US. Um, but it's really hard to monitor hypoxia at depth with like fixed sensors and that kind of thing. And so they, they've got the solution of deploying oxygen sensors in the crab traps as they go down so that they can tell in real time how these dead zones are sort of forming and expanding over the summer and then they can um, adjust uh, like where they're fishing accordingly based on that in real time. If I yep. I'll have to stop okay. it uh, there because the Zoom later. is going to disconnect in just 30 seconds. Okay. So we'll have to bring it to an end. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for those wonderful presentations. And limited though, but you know, really great discussions. And I would think that this, this is a start of those discussions. Please continue that outside uh, you know, this session. Uh, we learned that you know there are many things that are required to do uh, you know, get uh, adaptation right. You know, it can be perceptions, knowledge, technology, and other kinds of you know, things. So, uh, you know, there's this diversity of things that can really contribute to how we can set uh, uh, adaptation right. And we'll continue this discussion. Uh, thank you once again. I'll bring this to an end. Thank you.